So here's where I'm at writing my musical. I've written a background to build a world of my story and flesh out my characters. I have a scenario, a style. I know what I want to say. I even know how I want it to end. But that doesn't make it drama yet. It doesn't even make it a story. Because I have one big problem. And this is how I'm going to solve it. We're going to get geeky. Hi, I'm Scott. You're watching Inside Musicals, the channel for all things musical theatre. Writing a story is a bit like a puzzle. You start with one piece and only a vague idea of what it might be. Now, as you put the pieces together, it all becomes clearer. But if some parts are missing, you need to find new pieces to fill in those gaps to complete the picture. And that's my problem. Part of my story is missing. And I want to solve it before I go any further. Now, part of good writing is getting all the bad ideas out. And I can assure you, I've been doing plenty of that. But I do have some strong obstacles for my main character. The problem is, I don't have that one significant moment that ratchets up the tension so there's no turning back. And that's the part that propels the character into action, that kicks off Act 2. Because without that, there's no momentum, no stakes. And with nothing to resolve, there's no reason for the audience to care about it. In The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy lands in Munchkin Land, we know she's in danger. She wants to get home, so we're invested in what happens next. In Beauty and the Beast, when Belle takes her father's place as prisoner in the castle, we know she needs some way out. The only way is forward. In Mrs Doubtfire, when the father becomes a Scottish nanny, we know he's crossed the line. There's no taxi backsies There are going to be repercussions, and the further he goes, the worse they're going to be. And while the details of these stories are different, this structural pattern recurs so frequently, I'd be foolish to ignore it. In Victor Victoria, when Victoria pretends to be a man pretending to be a woman so she can perform, there's something at stake. In Tootsie, when Michael Dorsey becomes Dorothy Michaels to get a role in the daytime soap, now there's something to lose. Well, that's a lot of cross-dressing. <laughs> and I need that same moment in my story. I mean, not so much the cross-dressing, but that moment, that point of no return where each step just digs him in deeper. So at this stage, I have three options. I either redefine an existing element of my story to increase the stakes. I come up with a new element to bring everything together. Or I simply abandon this story in favour of something clearer, something better. But to make that decision, I'm going to outline my whole story so I have an overview of the dramatic structure. And actually, I need two outlines because I have a show within the show, a pantomime with its own discrete plot. Although I do want that plot to bump against the main story at times, to echo that story. Why do I make this so difficult for myself? And I've given myself two rules for the outline. No more than two pages and no dialogue. This is not a novel. It's an outline, and I want to simplify in order to organise my ideas. I want to focus on the doing rather than the talking, the machine that drives the drama. Because at this stage, no amount of dialogue, no matter how good it is, is going to fix underlying structural problems, problems with the drama. And I want the outline to address three things. My characters, to make sure they're all necessary, vibrant and service-specific function. My plot, so I know what happens, how, in what order and so I can plug any holes in the logic and fix any static drama. And I want both of these things to build the emotional core, the meaning of the story, because ultimately that's what an audience connects with. Now, the way I think of plot is not so much how one event leads to the next, but how each action or decision makes the next one necessary. And that builds a chain of events that's connected to character. Because you could say that just waking up in the morning leads to having breakfast. But it's not a causal relationship. I could just as easily skip breakfast without fundamentally changing the course of my day. Unless someone's trying to poison me, in which case I've just thwarted their first attempt. Score one for me. But waking up in the morning to discover I'm in someone else's body, well, that demands a response. I mean, how did this happen? Where is my body? How do I find my balance with boobs this big? The comedy just writes itself. Not that slapstick is story. And what if my character takes action to solve the problem, only to discover that my potential father-in-law, a wizard, naturally, has cast a spell to destroy my wedding? Now it's a story. There's a dynamic relationship between me, my father-in-law, my fiancé, whoever's in my body, and they're all necessary characters. Plus, there's a ticking clock, a clock ticking down to the wedding, because that's what's at stake. Will it go ahead as planned? In Beauty and the Beast, this metaphorical ticking clock is the enchanted rose. We know when the last petal falls, the prince is fated to forever remain a beast. So the rose represents both the stakes and the time frame. Now, not all stories have a ticking clock. 
sometimes a main character exhausts all options until they're cornered and have to face whatever's chasing them, metaphorically or literally. In South Pacific, when Nellie Forbush is told that Emil has died, her compassion for his mixed-race children overcomes her lifetime of, of bigoted conditioning. So when he returns, options are exhausted. She's out of excuses. There's no more barrier to their relationship. She's confronted her problem. So we need stakes in a story, and that's simply a measure of what's going on. It's much for the characters as for the audience. And there are two ways of looking at it. Either what do we want to happen by the end, or what do we fear will happen, and what to avoid. In Mrs Doubtfire, we want the family to reconcile. And while the character of Mrs Doubtfire offers a temporary reconciliation, because it's a lie, when she's unmasked, there's a reckoning. Out of options. Got to face the music. And while the parents don't get back together, I mean, this is not the parent trap, they do find a new equilibrium that is satisfying for the audience. So how do I solve the problem of my story? How do I create this want for the audience? Often there's some kind of inequity or injustice early in the story that makes us feel for the main character. Something with consequences they can't ignore, something that needs to be set to rights, and something the audience can relate to, so they care about it. In The King and I, Anna is a single mother, an English woman in a strange land. So when the king reneges on his agreement to give her a house outside of the palace, a symbol of her independence, suddenly there's a tug of war, a point of contention between them. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is an orphan girl whose aunt and uncle are too busy to notice her. Miss Gulch wants to kill Toto, her only friend. As if that's not enough, when her house lands on the Wicked Witch of the East, she makes an enemy of the Wicked Witch of the West, who can't be reasoned with. The only way is forward. And that's not unlike Harry Potter. Think about it. An orphan, ignored, pursued by an evil wizard. None can live while the other survives. That's stakes that must play out. And you'll notice there's always a character on the other end of this inequity. The King of Siam, Wicked Witch, Voldemort. An equally strong character who stands in the way of the main character. They embody the opposition to the main character's progress. Now that could be your classic antagonist, but it could also be a special character who somehow changes the main character's worldview. And often there's both. It's particularly noticeable in romantic comedies. In Guys and Dolls, Nathan Detroit stands in the way of Sky Masterson's reputation as a gambler, but it's Sarah Brown who changes Sky's worldview. In Romancing the Stone, it's the terrorists who stand in the way of Joan Wilder rescuing her sister, but it's the Michael Douglas character who changes her worldview. In Star Wars, it's Darth Vader who stands in the way of Luke saving Leia and thwarting the Empire, but it's Obi-Wan who changes Luke's worldview. Use the Force. So to identify these characters, maybe we can ask, who's most invested in the outcome of the story? And what will they do to either thwart or maintain the status quo? And somewhere in there, you'll find your main character and antagonist. So using that example of waking up in someone else's body, not the story of my musical, by the way, Although maybe the wizard is clearly the antagonist. But maybe the person who's in my body somehow changes my worldview so I become the person who's capable of solving that bigger problem. But how far will I go to set things to right? Would I betray my fiancé if that meant breaking a spell? Would I kill the wizard, my fiancé's father, even if that meant destroying his family's happiness? Or do I give up and say, eh, what you gonna do? Now, if I give up early in my story, I'm not a very worthy main character. But if I surrender later, when all options are exhausted, when that clock's ticked down, maybe that's my moment of change. My leap of faith. The test of my character as I risk the unknown to get to the other side. So what motivates me to push through? And in this scenario, how far will the wizard go to get what he wants? And what motivates him? And if it's a really good reason, maybe that's a great conundrum for the, for the climax. So to get my head around this two-page outline, I'm going to test my idea against three well-known theories of story. The hero's journey, the nutshell technique, and the dramatica theory of story. Now, there are literally hundreds of theories out there, and they can all be valid. These are just three that work for me because they offer three overlapping perspectives. And as long as you and your collaborator understand each other, use whatever language, whatever theory works for you. So if you've never heard of The Hero's Journey, I'm specifically referencing Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey, based on these same ideas. It represents human experience through mythical archetype and metaphor. 
Whereas a stereotype reduces a character to a set of characteristics, an archetype defines a character by its function. So a hero, mentor, guardian, ally, trickster, shapeshifter. And so they're much more flexible than any one set of characteristics. Now on its journey, a character might encounter situations like a call to adventure, crossing thresholds, tests, ordeals, resurrection, reward. And while all of these are symbolic, they're also actions, so characters are doing. And once you're familiar with these concepts, you'll see them pop up over and over in any George Lucas, James Cameron film, but even films like Notting Hill, Wizard of Oz, so they're very flexible. Now what I love about it is the shorthand for communicating universal ideas. On the downside, it can feel formulaic if you use it as just a paint-by-numbers tool without really joining the dots. Sorry for the mixed metaphor. I know you're judging me. Now, the next theory is the nutshell technique by Jill Chamberlain. And its strength for me is its simple representation of a classic three-act structure and the way it's connected to the main character. Uniquely, she suggests that main characters usually get what they think they want early in the story. Think Dorothy going over the rainbow in The Wizard of Oz and spends the rest of the story managing the repercussions of that to get what they need by the end. So in Dorothy's case, going home with a sense of belonging. What I like about it is the big picture view of the story, but I find it less useful for scene level detail or developing supporting characters. Plus some stories and main characters don't quite fit these principles, so it does have its limits. But my favourite theory is the dramatic theory of story, because it's so comprehensive and adaptable. It started life as a thesis to explain story structure across cultures, and then, then was developed into software to help you put all those pieces together. And while there is a book version of it, I think you really need the software to put it to use, because it's incredibly detailed. Now, it does draw on archetypes similar to the hero's journey, but it divides the story into four thematic perspectives that are deeply connected to character in what they call the grand argument story. It outlines progressions and signposts in each of these themes that you can then use to develop scenes. So it's very practical in that sense. Uniquely, they distinguish between a protagonist and a main character as two separate functions. The first pursues a story goal. The second is the one with whom we most identify. But where one character embodies both functions, it combines to become the hero. And whereas a lot of other theories use these terms interchangeably, they're very specific here. They also distinguish between character change and character growth, which is where I see a lot of other theories get a bit hazy. For instance, an innocent man accused of a crime couldn't remain steadfast to his innocence, he doesn't change, but he can grow in the process, become a more resourceful version of himself. What I love about it is it keeps track of every thread in the story. It is a steep learning curve, but well worth the effort. On the downside, the software, at least for Mac, is still only 32-bit, so it won't work on any machine that runs on anything after, I think, OS 10, 15. So I'm going to use the nutshell technique to define the big picture moments of my story, Dramatica to develop the detail, and then the hero's journey to enrich those moments. But remember, theory is not a formula. It's not a set of rules. It's an observation of storytelling patterns. So I'm gonna treat them as a checklist or assessment tool. In the same way that music theory doesn't tell you how to write music, it simply explains why it works according to certain criteria. So when it doesn't work, you're better placed to understand why and to solve it. Now in my musical, I have a set of givens, things I wanna include, things I wanna say, things that draw me to the story. But I know as I outline, I need to be prepared to let some of those go if they no longer serve a purpose. That's just writing. And writing could be brutal. But piece by piece, we can build something beautiful. Pretty. So how do you develop your story? How do you decide what stays or goes? Do you have any tips? Share them in the comments. I would love to hear if you're facing hurdles like me, for no other reason to think that I'm not alone. But once again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. And it really helps the channel. I love you.